how big is the thing, what shape is it. And we were able to confirm that it is indeed you know, an octagonal cavity structure. Uh, and it doesn't seem to be you know, something residential. Uh, accounts from the Rollins family uh, suggest that it was filled in back in the 1870s, 1880s. Um, so this interior is all full of, you know, 1880s dirt that has junk from a bunch of different time periods. It's, it's not sort of intact. It's just a jumbled mass of stuff from various different time periods from, you know, 1870s on, on back. And that's about, you know, like maybe two feet, two, two feet of that. But when you go down two feet, then you encounter a floor surface, which is what, what you see in this, this big trench here. And on that floor, you know, you, it's got sort of a tabby, -ish, a tabby floor. Uh, there's some areas where it's sort of paired. And um, one of the things that we found that was particularly exciting for us was a uh, wine seal that dated to the Macintosh. Do you want to tell them about the wine? Well, um, this. this, this Plantation is called Kingsley Plantation, but definitely on Anna Kingsley not the first people to be here and have a plantation. In fact, there were several other people here in the 18th and early 19th century that had a plantation area, including during the Second Spanish period, um, a fellow named John McQueen or John Ron McQueen, who was from Georgia, came down to uh, run away from bad debt. Uh, he didn't want to go to debt as a prison. So um, he's a friend of George Washington and Marquita Lafayette during the Revolution, but apparently doesn't save him from bad debt. So he fled to a foreign country, Spanish Florida, uh, and as a um, gift, the governor of St. Augustine, as a friend of his, gave him the vine, uh, and he built a plantation there, and cleared the land, uh, and eventually built the main house in 1797, 1798. Um, he has to eventually sell the plantation because apparently he's not as good a planner here as he was in Georgia, and then back here. So he sells it to someone named Joe McIntosh. Well, McIntosh lives in France, you know, for in 1812-1813 when he has to flee to Georgia because he started a war and he can't finish it. <laughs> the Spanish are going to uh, uh, probably hang him if they catch him. So they have to go back to, uh, to Georgia. Everything here in the summer of 1812, July, August, uh, slowly burns to the ground. Uh, and in the list of the losses, he writes types of everything that was lost and he's trying to get reparations, trying to get to the U.S. government to pay for any of the burning even when he started the war. Um, one of the things that his, uh, his uh, foreman, his uh, overseer, says that was here, that was lost when the Seminoles attacked, was that there were, uh, in the basement of the main mountain, there's a basement there, and it was a stock full of wine that he had specially prepared in bottles with his name on it in France. And so we found on the floor of the sugar mill a shoulder seal that said J.H. McIntosh on it. Uh, which is pretty cool. Um, we didn't know, of course, uh, exactly where it came from because it was in soil that had been scraped around from all over when they dumped it into the center of the mill to bury the mill in the 1870s, early 1880s, early 1880s. Uh, so it, but it's on the floor. So it could have been embedded in the floor when someone, some drunken Indian dropped in 1812. Like, like, <laughs> smash. <laughs> or, it could have been laying over here, and someone dragged it up with a big dragged uh, bucket and a mule, and they buried it in uh, 1882 or something. So it was on the floor, which was suspicious, uh, but we didn't know exactly that it was in place. It could have been just dropped in the first artifact jumped in 1885 or something. So we always, we'd assume this was a Kingsley mill, built when the Kingsley arrived in 1814 or later, but in fact, having this on the floor suggests that maybe it was before Kingsley. Uh, and so we had to investigate the mill further to find out when it dated to because having that on the floor was somewhat suspicious. Yeah, because we actually, there were, we were gratified to find that there actually was a cavity structure where the map said that there should be a cavity structure, but we had two, two problems with it still. We weren't sure of the chronology, and we, we didn't know exactly when it was built, and we weren't 100% sure what its, what its function was, because it's described variously as you know, sugar mill, grist mill, mill mill. Um, there's a couple of different things that you could have going on in kind of an octagonal structure like that. Um, basically, the way it probably operated is you had an animal walking around inside that was powering powering the machinery. Um, if it's an animal-powered sugar mill, that would make it sort of earlier. Um, but there are other kind of roundish animal-powered things that, that you can have. There's a picture over here of an animal-powered uh, cotton baler that's conceptually pretty similar. I don't know if you can take a look at this later. But Just put walls around it and you yeah. have a, a cotton. Please famous that it's going to take about 30 minutes. 
Do that out for you. Take about thought, half. I thought, like, when you change the oil in your car, you sometimes get, like, stains in your driver. I thought it was just the stain from the lubricating fluid they use to lubricate the crushing work. I thought it was just a ghost footprint of where the machine used to sit. I said, we're just going to cut it in half, take a photograph of it, draw a little picture of it, and we're done. That was a great theory. It was a great theory. <laughs> Unfortunately, it wasn't right. So, Cleek jumps down with my shovel and starts hacking at this thing, and about five minutes in, he pulls up a handful of vertebrae and goes, oh, oh no. God. Yeah, because the vertebrae, you know. They were articulated, and it turned out to be an intact pig skull. For a minute, I thought it was something other than a pig, but yeah. Um, the last person out of the mill. The last person out of the mill. Never <laughs> made it out. So, um, there's a deliberately, yeah, there's a deliberately buried, uh, Pig buried sort of under the floor of the mill. In the center, in the with, center. with his rear facing north and his snout facing south on a, on a cardinal direction. Now, this confused us greatly because we already found a pig over here. Inside the fill, that's the interior uh, of, the, of the wall, that's the exterior, that's the interior. In the fill that they had put in the 1880s to bury the mill, someone decided to bury a pig there. Um, now, he's sort of laying sort of you know, on his belly. Yeah, that one's clearly kind of dumped in there. It's it, not yeah, deliberate. It looks like a sort of an execution style, like uh, maybe sort of a gangland slaying sort of thing. <laughs> uh, but this guy is laid out uh, very nicely uh, on his side. He has a nice compass uh, uh, bearing. Uh, it's all nicely arranged. He's in a pit, uh, not in some sort of drill slump of them. So they're literally only about five feet apart from each other, but they may have vastly different um, uh, histories and they may be separated in time by decades. We don't know. Um, so I can I can interpret this pig all day long. Just a trash pig that got rolled in when they buried yeah. the mill. Uh, pig number two is a lot more complicated, uh, and I still have not decided which lie to tell. Yeah, we go back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So because this was like the last day, you know, all we really knew was oh, okay, there's a pig. You know, we need sort of more time to kind of interpret the, the stratigraphy of, you know, where the, how the pig was All buried. All we got was the pig and the pit the pig was in. We did not see the bigger picture. We had to go back to 2010, 2009, and 2010. I take all the dirt out of those, uh, uh, those units uh, just to have a starting point to look at where the pig was. Yeah. The pig mark two. Pig mark two. Yeah. So in 2010, we come back, uh, excavate the area where the pig has been to try to, you know, get a better sense of, the placement of the pig burial and which other things. And we find that there's some big pit underneath it. Um, big pit. Big pit. It's part of some other like half the circular room. something or other. So we excavate, we, you know, we try to excavate that. At the end of the 2010 field season, I actually feel stupider than I did when we started. Like I know less. Now. There are I features on top of features, yeah. and we can't quite figure out the chronology. Um, I assume, I mean, when we saw the pig, the pig is below a tabby floor. Um, if you just wanted to get rid of a pig, uh, you could throw it into the river. Yeah. Uh, there's also some soft dirt just out the door. You could just stick him in some soft sand. I don't know why you want to punch through a tabby floor and bury. What's that? Well, tabby. These walls yeah. are now tabby. Tabby is just proof on the concrete. And the place to show on the island. And so it's basically like digging through a, a, a soft concrete floor to bury your pig in. Now, why would you want to do that? That's crazy. Um, so there's only written this is in the dead center of the mill where the machinery would have been. So there's really only two easy times that, that piece of property would have been available to bury your pig in. Before you put the machine in or when you take the machine out. So either when they build the mill or when they tear the mill down. Now when you tear the mill down, why on earth would you want to bury a pig there? Well, why on earth would you want to buy a bury a pig when you start? Well, there's there's one interpretation you can go with, and you can say, in fact, it is just some sort of dedication sacrifice. Um, we had just, in 2006, our first summer, we found an animal sacrifice in one of the site cabins. The, the, the vast majority of the African people who lived in the cabins were African born. They're Central African, West African, and you know, African religion, African language, African names. And a uh, very common thing to do in West Africa when you build a building is to have an animal sacrifice. Uh, you dedicate uh, the sacrifice to uh, uh, a deity or the spirits in the earth to appease them when you disturb the soil. Um, so finding a, a chicken sacrifice in the floor of cabin West 15 made perfect sense. But you can also have animal sacrifice in the British Isles, in Great Britain, in you know, Scotland, Wales, England, Ireland, um, up into the 19th century. When you build a building, you can bury a bull's head, 
uh, or a horse's head or a dog in the sill uh, or a doorway of a building that's from pre-Christian times all the way to the 19th century. Kingsley is Scottish and English, uh, and he's not Christian per se, but he certainly has been steeped in the folklore of his people. Um, and so maybe, because he has an African wife, he's got all these Africans running around, and he knows about the folk beliefs of his own people in Scotland, maybe he thinks it's okay to put an animal sacrifice in the dedication of the building before they put uh, the machinery on top of it in the center of the mill. But then it gets even more complicated because, yeah. in fact, the pig, it's not just when you build it or when you tear it down, there's something in between. Yeah. So at the end of the 2010 field season, I felt dumber than I did when we started. Um, we come back in 2011 and sort of re-investigate this big circular... We make it a bigger one. We make a bigger one. Because that's, that's basically how archaeologists solve problems. You know, you, just you don't it. understand, you just make it more bigger and eventually it'll, it'll, it'll make sense. Or it's gone. Or it's, it's gone. Sleep better than that. So when we make the hole bigger, we're able to... The Smiths is possible that the cemetery is not... Does it begin with kings? Does it end with kings? That it may have been a cemetery used for Macintosh and Rookreen beforehand. And if he arrived on this landscape of the cemetery in place, he may have continued to use that space. So if the cemetery was there in King of the Iran, a marked space that holds the dead of Africans, they may have used it and expanded upon it. If that's the case, it probably uh, is a limiting factor in regards to where he put the slave camps. Because in um, West Africa, uh, like Ebo and Yoruba, and that's what a lot of the Africans are here from that part of central and southern Nigeria, they don't have cemeteries. They perform house burial or yard burial. They bury in the floor of the houses, but they bury in their, in their front yard because they want a domestic burial because they believe in reincarnation and they want their ancestors to come back and their children, not someone else's children. So they want to keep their, their dead very close to them. Um, but some of these Africans are from Central Africa uh, and they believe in burial from a distance. They don't want to be that close to them. So it's a tricky business to make everyone happy. So I think um, that putting the, the cemetery there, or using the cemetery there if it, if it does exist, and putting the cabins around it, they're all in the yard, so to speak, they're in the greater yard of these cabins, they're all visible, uh, I mean they all can see the cemetery and it's all part of the greater yard, but it's still far enough away that there's a separation. So if the cemetery predates it, the placement of the cabins is the limit to the placement of the cabins. You can't put the cabins over here if these people are not going to be happy about where they're dead yet. So knowing when these buildings date to is not just, you know, just uh, some some armchair curiosity. Right?